In this part of the October 2020 Chem Connection, we will discuss with the director of the European Chemicals Agency, Björn Hansen, the ambitious European agenda for a toxic-free European environment. The just published European Commission's communication on a chemical strategy for sustainability is one of the pillars of the European Green Deal. This chemical strategy will lead to a major reform of the EU's chemical assessment system. Some expect it to overhaul REACH and COP procedures. What can we expect from this chemical strategy in the near and more distant future? This is something I will discuss with Björn Hansen, of course at ECHA, in Helsinki. Hello Björn, can you share with us the key priorities of the chemical strategy for sustainability? Hi Chert, and thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to have this question and answer session with you. Uh, in terms of the chemical strategy, what I'd what the way I would look at it is basically say, what from ICAT do we see should be in there in order to make our life more impactful and work better? And I think if I would just start with just the chemical, a key that's out there, all the pieces of chemicals legislation, then I think an improvement in the way they work together in order to create more synergies, more efficiency, and more consistency is definitely one thing that I would like to see in there. Another thing that I like to see in there is a much better sharing of data so that we actually all who look at a specific chemical wherever you, you are in the union system, you have access to all the same data. That's another thing that I think would, uh, would really help. Thirdly, clearly, we need a lot of innovation in the chemicals that we use in order to get more sustainable substances. So an, an innovation agenda to help and support industry find the right compounds that we need in the future to produce. So I think those are three elements that I would definitely see in it. Those are indeed important elements. Let's start with the strengthening of the EU framework that will include endocrine disruptors, PFAS, nanomaterials and polymers, but also the introduction of the mixture assessment factor into Annex 1 of REACH to take into account the combined toxicity of different substances. Can you tell us more about that? Those are political objectives to get them included uh, into the whole legislative system. And what I can say about it is I do think that we have the tools to be able to implement those concepts. If I just take some of the, these um, issues as examples, uh, assessment factors uh, to account for mixtures. Well, if policy wants uh, to account for mixtures in our day-to-day -day risk assessment, then the one and only way that we can see in ICA practical to do it would be to include an ass additional assessment factor in our risk assessment. And that can be done with an adap adaptation to an annex through a comatology procedure. Endocrine disruptors. Basically, we are pretty good at ICA um, at identifying endocrine disruptors. We've been doing that now for years, and it's working very smoothly, the process. What we don't have in many cases is the right data. So if we would uh, be looking at a more smooth system at identifying endocrine disruptors, then we would need to uh, adapt uh, the testing requirements to be able to identify substances either earlier or simpler uh, as being endocrine disruptors. That's just two examples. But I think we have the tools, and I think that uh, as soon as we get the green light and the resources, uh, we can roll up the sleeves and start working on that with the Commission. Great to see that you're ready for it. Another priority is promoting safe and sustainable innovation. What kind of innovation is needed, and what can we expect? Well, this one is a really difficult one, and we need uh, to discuss from a scientific technical angle, but also from a policy angle, reasonably early and fast to get a good idea of what we mean. And the reason is that these sustainable chemicals are part of the solution of the whole Green Deal. We will not reach the aim of the Green Deal, it be zero pollution uh, uh, ambition, nor climate neutrality, without having chemicals as an integral part of it. And those chemicals that we have today are not meeting these requirements of uh, climate neutrality, of circularity, and of the increased health and environment um, level of protection that I'm seeing in the Commission papers. So therefore, we must stimulate the innovation in order to be able to ensure that we have these chemicals in the future. And for that, we must define what is the chemical that we actually want in our society in 2050 and then go for it. 
Okay, another key element of the chemical strategy is one substance, one assessment. How can this be achieved over the various uh, regulation for and uses of substances? I think maybe the place to start is to illustrate why things are a bit complicated at the moment. And by making that illustration, you can start seeing what the solutions could be. And I can illustrate a little bit how our thinking is of what at least one of the solutions can be for this. If you have a substance like a phthalate in plastic uh, that is being assessed one year by EFSA in terms of its use in food contact material, and then three years later by ICA in the very same plastic but for different uses, then to get those opinions coordinated, first of all in time, second of all in terms of the data that they have between each other, Third of all, it's two organizations physically separated with two scientific committees. To get a proper uh, coordination of that work requires quite a lot of efforts. And there you already start seeing that the best way to get best, uh, the, 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 the best out of the money spent at EU level is to try to reduce this type of necessity of coordination between the agencies up front. Of course, we want to coordinate, we do coordinate, but the less that we have to do, in particular under time pressure, the easier and better the whole machinery will, will, will work. So my view on one substance, one assessment is that we decide, meaning policy decides, let's look at this substance. Then the, it's clear that that substance will then be assessed by one agency, EMA for medicines, uh, EFSA for food relevant chemicals and ICA basically for everything else. But we do an assessment that covers a bigger, a big scope, so the full scope, and then we get help from the other agencies in our assessment, but we don't need to have coordination between our scientific committees um, and our staff uh, in, in very tight uh, timelines. So for me, that would be a way to avoid the necessity under strict timelines to coordinate two independent scientific committees in two agencies which are working uh, geographically far apart. Okay, which role can ECHA play in the implementation of this strategy? I think that basically our track record shows one of the roles, one of the big roles that we can play. Um, almost every year we're asked to do a new task which is related to chemical risk assessment chemical risk management or information technology around chemicals. And that's our strengths, that's where our competences lay. And in effect, um, there's not a huge difference between neither risk assessment, risk management or, or information technology solutions between cosmetics, uh, this, uh, what we do in REACH, what's done in, in pesticides or plant protection products or done somewhere else. It's very much the same. And basically, by having the Commission outsource to the three sister agencies all this assessment work for implementing all the chemicals legislation, uh, where each of us has our own weight or our own uh, center of, of competence in the types of chemicals we look at, you can get a system which is much more efficient. And that's what I would be looking at for ICA and also the other sister agencies of ours that we would be doing scientific and technical support to more and more legislation around those competences that each of us has. The strategy also mentions the reform of the REACH authorization and restriction processes. In what direction will this reform take us? That <laughs> is a combination of solving technical problems and where policy wants it to go. What I can speak about is the solving the technical problems that we have. And I think if you look at authorization, one of the things that we, we, we are seeing is that it is more complex, uh, more uh, in-depth than we had actually originally uh, envisioned. It's, say, coming towards, it is not, but it's towards a permitting type of process rather than having it more like a more generic, sim simpler safety assessment um, and alternatives assessment. And I think that the authorization system that we would like to see in ICA is one that is more generic, more targeted, equally safe, equally strong on the analysis of alternatives, 
but avoids the necessity to go into the grand detail that we sim simply uh, or that we're doing at the moment. On the restrictions, I think we can really look back at uh, how many years? It's almost 30 years of restrictions in the EU, over 10 years here at ICA, and try to harvest our lessons that we've learned in order to see where do we need deep science in order to support a restriction, and where is the, the science not needed to be so deep? And I can give a good example. Actually, two. <laughs> Uh, one is our lead in PVC restriction, where when we wrote it as ICA Secretariat, we didn't go into grand detail about how toxic lead is. We simply referred to the WHO and we said, we all know lead has no threshold and is very toxic. So avoid lead exposure. And that's how we, we built our whole assessment on. Uh, microplastics was a similar one where we basically ended up saying, if you look at the literature out there, together with the fact that a microplastic, is, if it ends up in the environment, will be there for centuries, then there's quite a lot of uncertainties about the toxic effects or negative environmental impacts around a microplastic being in the environment that we basically said, based on those two facts alone, it's plastic around for a very long time and it has chemicals, toxic chemicals inside, uh, is enough to say that there's a concern without having to specify which polymers make the plastic and exactly which chemicals are in the microplastic. So these are all we were able to do and our, our risk assessment committee and the other committee support uh, this way of going, basically because we've seen from the history that there are situations where we don't need to go into deep, deep science because it's so evident <laughs> up front. But then there are other areas where you certainly need to go into the deep, deep science to reach a good opinion. Very clear. What competences and efforts are needed from the key stakeholders to make the strategy a success? Uh, I think we all need to up a level, uh, but we definitely need to up a level jointly and we need to uh, look at which areas um, would it be good to specialize. And here, if I think on the innovation uh, angle, where industry will need to explore and find and develop new chemicals that, like I said in the very beginning, that use less energy in their production, that ensure circularity and that are less toxic, then one way that I could imagine is that um, why, why have a situation where all chemical companies in Europe would need to have staff and competence on the toxicity of the chemicals? Why not use the fact that we have a substantially big um, agency here, here in Helsinki with a lot of competent people on exactly that, uh, the toxic effects of chemicals, and use that uh, as a source of knowledge, as a source of competence for, for chemical companies in order for them to be able to focus more on the uh, innovation of finding chemicals that are circular, or finding chemicals that degrade fast if they are emitted into the environment. And we can help them with our competence on toxicity of chemicals, for example. The Green Deal aims to take circular economy beyond the economy. Could you sketch how the chemical industry could operate in, let's say, 2040, 2050 and make a vital contribution to society in a greener Europe? Uh, I can give a bit of a picture. It's not my picture because I pick it up from bits and pieces of what I read and I see and definitely a lot of the idea that I'm coming with uh, come from CEFIC itself, the chemical manufacturing industry. But the starting point is that you will see, I think, chemical companies who will be sourcing their source material, so the raw material to manufacture chemicals, uh, will shift. Today, it's very much crude oil or, in some cases, bio-based um, inputs, so uh, corn oil or, or plants or trees. And there will be a big shift that will move this over to waste streams. So basically, your production sites will become chemical recycling sites with waste streams as being the input, the raw material that goes, that goes in. Of course, in order to achieve circularity and low energy, that raw material cannot be the raw material we have today. A lot of the raw materials we have today, like metals, need very high energy to be able to recycle. Or, like many plastics, 
Um, they can only be recycled with some energy, but through the, the, the mechanical recycling, together with some of the melting processes, the plastic that comes out has an inferior quality, and ba basically the products that ended up in the waste can only be replaced with primary plastic material. The only way to get out of that is to make sure that the materials that actually end up as being the raw material for the new production sites in the future, that they have been geared for chemical recycling or for material recycling. So the chemical industry will shift its raw material input in order to produce its chemicals, but we also have to make sure that those raw material inputs coming from waste are different than the ones we have today. Björn, thank you very much for your insights on this part of the ambitious European Green Deal. Well, thanks. Uh, it was great being here and talking to you, Chad.